While I'm getting organized here, you can turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Uh, Don has already reminded you of the evangelism table that's in the fellowship uh, room and uh, shown you an example of um, what's out there. Uh, I'm wearing one of the lapel pins. I know you need your binoculars to see it from back there. Um, these items have d different forms of effectiveness. Obviously, the, uh, the lapel pin is, is, uh, is not effective from great distance, but at the checkout line in Wegmans, uh, it works very well. We're getting a lot of looks, and uh, uh, people do notice it at close range. We have other things, obviously, back there that are better suited for longer range, so uh, we gave you a little uh, uh, variety there to choose from. And that's going to be the subject of our uh, discussion this morning. If you're all in Romans chapter 10, I'm going to begin reading in verse 9. The context is a little hard to jump in here, but uh, this concerns um, uh, what's necessary uh, as a person comes to the point of salvation and conviction concerning their sin. Um, and uh, Paul tells us here, beginning in, in verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Before we go any further, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this uh, opportunity to um, uh, share uh, your word with uh, our people, Lord, and, and Father, for the, uh, the, the subject at hand. And, and Lord, uh, evangelism is a, um, a vital activity in, in church life. And Father, um, uh, there's a lot of confusion about it. There's a lot of hesitation about it. And Lord, we pray that uh, uh, this might be, some of this might be abated today by your will and, and according to your grace. And Lord, we just pray that uh, you are I'm together now in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Paul says in verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus in the King James, uh, I don't know how that's rendered in your Bible, but I love the New American Standard there where it says, confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. That puts the emphasis, I think, where it needs to be. And so I always use that uh, when I share the gospel with somebody. Also, in verse 11, it says, For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now, that's rather confusing, um, unless you understand that uh, in this day and age when uh, Paul spoke this and, uh, originally, um, we had just come out of the Old Covenant into, into the New, and the Old Covenant was all about uh, the Jews, predominantly about the Jews. Gentiles were known as dogs. And um, now having moved into the New Covenant, uh, there are Gentiles who might think uh, that, that they need to be ashamed at even the thought of, of coming to Christ and, uh, and developing a relationship with God. And that's why he says in verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, Jew and Greek, uh, because he wants these people to know in the Roman church and he wants us to know that um, uh, there is no difference in the new covenant, that all who call upon him can be saved, and they're all equal. And sure enough, he says in verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, beginning with verse 14, uh, Paul deals with uh, four pertinent questions. Paul was very good at asking questions in order to make a point. And um, he, this, this is no exception. In verse 14, he says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? That's a valid question. If someone doesn't believe, how in the world are they going to call upon him? How, how are they going to know enough? The next question, And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? They have to hear about him in order to believe, in order to call upon him. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense. And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
Now, of course, that's not Pastor Ken and that's not me. That's everyone. That's all of us. Someone needs to teach them about the gospel in order for them to, so that they hear it, so they, they can believe it, so that they can call upon him. Uh, so how shall they, uh, and the next question in verse 15, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have all, not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed in the Lord? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Uh, your translation may say the word of God, God and Christ, Christ being God. Uh, it really doesn't make any difference there. But he says um, in, in verse, the last part of verse 15, uh, uh, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed our gospel. When you share the gospel with someone, not everyone is going to respond. They may respond or they may not, or they may respond later at the uh, urging of someone else, of another Christian. Uh, you have no guarantee of that. Our job is to give the message, amen? amen. And um, we, we don't try to presuppose what the re response is going to be. It's awfully nice if the response is positive, but that's not always going to happen. And in fact, it's usually not the case the first time. Uh, and you have to become accustomed to that. Um, so in verse 17, he winds up uh, uh, this discussion by saying, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we know that uh, for someone to believe, they must understand the word of God concerning the gospel. Now, I have some questions for you uh, that I think are very important. Uh, firstly, is God finished with his redemptive plan? That is, is he, is he through saving people? in your estimation? Absolutely not. I mean, one day he will be, but we don't know when that day is going to be, and until that day, uh, people will be saved. He saved you and me, right? That's ample evidence. So isn't it reasonable to assume that he has a crop of people that has yet to be harvested? Yes, yes it is. And if so, does he not plan to use us in accomplishing the work? Paul just told us about that. We just read about it in Romans chapter 10. Were we not saved through the witness of one or more Christians? Yes. They were faithful in presenting God's redemptive plan to you and me, right? Final question. Is it not incumbent upon us then to be faithful toward those who have yet to believe? Amen. Yes, indeed. All right, interesting words, but so far what I've told you is of little help to you. Unless you didn't know that it was our job to present the gospel. And we did cover that in Romans chapter 10. But other than that, I've been of little help to you. You see, over the years, I've heard a lot of messages on the radio and so on gospel, or, or about presenting the gospel, about soul winning. I've heard a lot of them, and I know you have too, and they all emphasize to basically go out and get them. Those, those are some of the words I've heard preachers use. You know, to go witness, go up on the street corner with tracks or whatever you'd like to do. But very rarely have I ever heard a method taught for reaching the lost, for gaining an audience. Until Pastor Ken came, and he actually taught a, mess, a method. He actually gave us a method. And then he and I got together and we expanded on that a little bit, and uh, that's gonna be the, the bulk of, the, of the, the, the discussion this morning. And that's the most important, important part of this entire thing, is that we need a method. Because I know that you've sit, sat in pews and listened to fire-burning, soul-winning messages and wondered, well, how am I going to do this? Where do I begin? Um, how does this happen? And um, so 
We've established the requirement to share the gospel already this morning, but don't have a method for finding who God wants us to present the gospel to. Now, um, we've had techniques over the years. I remember when uh, Pastor Gary was here, uh, we had EE, remember EE, Evangelism Explosion? And, um, and a lot of people learned that and tried it uh, door to door. And, uh, but again, that was mostly uh, concentrated upon sharing the gospel rather than finding an audience to share it with. Uh, later on, when Pastor Saunders was here, we had a, a, a program known as Evantel. Remember that? I, we went through that twice. It was a video series, Evantel. And again, that was very, a, a very uh, interesting approach to sharing the gospel, but had little to say about the method for finding individuals to share it with. How do we go about this? Um, so there are two aspects. There's gaining an audience, and then there's knowing what to say or the, the ability to share the gospel once you've gained the audience. And it's the gaining the audience part that we need to focus on here. Actually, we need to focus on both. If you're not ready when you get an audience, then you won't know what to say, obviously. But we need to focus on that part which has heretofore been largely untouched. And uh, the, the scriptures have a lot to say about it. Now, these two banners that uh, Debbie and Naomi so skillfully put together came out of the Evantel uh, uh, process that uh, Pastor Saunders uh, presented to us. And the second one is the one we're talking about on this side, opportunity. We need opportunity. And the scriptures, as I just mentioned, have a lot to say about gaining that opportunity. So let's continue and focus on that as you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is another text that's difficult to jump into the middle of, but for, for brevity's sake, we're going to do that. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is actually um, a call to holiness, a call to being reconciled with God. And there's a very strong reason for that that we'll discover here as we go along. So we'll pick it up in verse 14. There's no good place to jump in, but we'll jump in there. In verse 14, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. Now, Paul is trying to impress upon us something that, that's probably very basic to our knowledge here, but nonetheless, we need to be refreshed on it, is the fact that if Christ died for all, then everyone is dead in sins and trespasses, meaning there's an ample supply of people to share the gospel with out there. There's no one out there that's going to get to glory, get to heaven on their own without Jesus Christ. He died for all, so all are dead. Verse 15 and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. You know, we get, we get all wrapped up in self. We get all wrapped up in the things that, that we're involved with. And to a certain extent, that's very natural. I mean, we have to go to Wegmans and get our groceries, and we have to buy clothing, and we have to go to work, and, and we have to have transportation, we have to put gas in the car. We do all those things. And of course, those are necessary things, but what he's talking about here is to be so self-absorbed that we, we, we just do not pursue the things that the Lord wants us to pursue and, and tread, tread the path that the Lord wants us to tread. So there's a balance there. Okay, verse 15 again, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, we quote this verse a lot. We take it out of its context context and we quote it, and it's an excellent verse, but it's interesting when it's back in the context to understand what Paul is doing with this. 
He's saying if anyone is, one is in Christ, he is a new creation. There's, uh, we've, got to, we've got to come out of the world and out of our self-centeredness and begin to focus on the things of Christ and the things that God wants us to do. And he's preparing us with remarks with these remarks for, for a job that we have to do that's job one for every one of us, and that is reaching the lost with the gospel. So he says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. He's reminding us, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's a different life now, once you're in Jesus Christ. The sinful things we did before, we don't do those anymore, if we claim to be Christians. We walk as God would have us to walk. All right, now in verse 18, he's going to begin to, to apply all that he's been telling us here about this call to holiness. He says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now why has he spent so much time up to this point in talking about our life being dedicated to God and not to self? Well, it's because of verse 18 and following. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us, there it says it again, the word of reconciliation. And of course the word is important because we learned in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now we're gonna to begin to get into this method that I spoke of a moment ago. Paul is going to get into that and he teaches it very clearly. In verse 20, he says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. Did you catch the way he finished verse 20 there? He says, now we are ambassadors for Christ. And you know what I expected him to say following that? As though God were pleading through us, go and share the gospel with people. That's what I expected him to say, but you see what he says there? He says, we implore you on, on uh, Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. There's the plea again to, to, to being to, to having a, a holy walk with God if you're going to be an ambassador. If you're going to am, be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, you must have a walk that's, that's commensurate with that job, which is job one for all of us. So he says, now then, we were our ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. If you're going to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, you must be reconciled to God. Now that word ambassador is the word representative. We're to represent him. All right, in verse 21, for he made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Again, imploring us to a walk of righteousness if we're going to do this job as ambassadors. Now we have to understand, here's where the method comes in, we have to understand the job of an ambassador. What is an ambassador's job and how does such a person conduct themselves? Well, first of all, they leave their home country and they go to a foreign country and they reside there. All right, they reside in something called an embassy. You're all familiar with that, I'm sure. When they get there, they don't hide because they're there, there to represent the country that they come from. So they don't hide. They fly their flag out in front of the embassy so all those in that foreign country know who they are and who to come to concerning matters between the two nations. They hang their flag out. Along the way, natural relationships develop as their tenure there goes on. Now also, they are knowledgeable in the things about their country in order that they might correctly impart information to those who inquire. Are you making the connections here? I hope you're making the connections. They are knowledgeable in the things 
about their country in order that they might correctly impart information to those who inquire. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're instructed here concerning this. 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 13 through 15. First Peter three chapter, uh, for chapter three verses thirteen through fifteen, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed, and do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God, or your Bible may say that Christ as Lord, in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense or an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. They must be knowledgeable, an ambassador must be knowledgeable about the country they come from in order to correctly impart information to those who inquire. We must know the gospel to present. We must have the information to give them. All right, also, they stand firm in the face of adversity, knowing that not everyone is going to be in agreement with their country's policies. That's the job of an, of an ambassador. Now, we are ambassadors from a country called heaven. There is no earthly country that is our home. We sing that, that hymn, uh, the, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up beyond the blue. So we are, wherever we are, we are ambassadors from a country called heaven. So what flag do we fly? An ambassador, when they get to that foreign country, they put a flag out, their flag out, so people know the country they represent. What is our flag? Well, Don held one up here for you this morning. I have another one. This is very nice. It'll sit on your desk or in your home or, or wherever you want people to see it. And this is Josh, the Joshua 24, 15 uh, verse that I'm holding. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There are many other choices out there on the table. What flag do we fly so that people know what country we're from? See, that's what an ambassador does. And that's what Paul is teaching us here. What flag do we fly? It's whatever identifies us with that country, actually. And there's a lot of flexibility there. And you, you need to use your imagination. But the things that we have offered you on that table are, uh, go a long way, I think, to giving you the flag that you can fly in order to identify with Christ and with a country called heaven. And what foreign nation are we assigned to? Wherever God puts us among the lost and dying of this world. That's who we're sent to. That's the nation that we're sent to as ambassadors. That's our Jerusalem, where God has you naturally during the day. You don't have to work on trying to figure out where to go to find people to share the gospel with. They're right there where God has you naturally on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, where's this flag in Scripture? Where's this flag business in Scripture? Well, that's a fair question. So, how did Jesus do it? Uh, turn to John chapter 2. And let's look how the Lord did it. I mentioned to you that there are a lot of, a lot of flags that are available, depending on the circumstances and the situation. And the Lord's flag was his miracles. John chapter 2, we'll, we'll pick it up with verse 11. This is the account of uh, him turning, his first miracle, turning the water into wine. And verse 11 says, This beginning of signs or miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. As a result of his miracle, his disciples believed in him because that was his flag. 
That's how he identified as God and with, and with heaven. Over, over and above any other individual. Move on down to verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now, let's pause there and consider something for a moment. Couldn't he have just walked about? I mean, he was God in the flesh. Couldn't he just have walked about over there and they would have known? No, he couldn't. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us he had no form or comeliness, comeliness that we should desire him. There was nothing special about his appearance in his flesh. He looked like any ordinary person. He had to identify with heaven in order to achieve uh, his evangelistic results. And that's what we see him doing here. His miracles did the job. We're going to talk in a moment about miracles concerning this. They're still available, and we're going to talk about them in a moment. All right, move on to John chapter 3, this account with Nicodemus, and verse 2. This man, that was Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Now notice why. For no one can do these miracles that you do unless God is with him. Unless God is with him. All these miracles. That's how Nicodemus knew. One more, the list is exhaustive. I think the ones we've gone through here, you, you can probably think of some that, that uh, you're familiar with. But let's move on to John chapter 11 and, and look at one final one. John chapter 11 and verse 45. It says here, then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. You notice that? And had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. All right, we need a little variety now. So what kind of flag did Paul use? We, could, we, we can go on and dig out a lot of examples. I'll just do this one more just to give you the idea. He used whatever one was handy and what was appropriate for the situation. Turn to Acts chapter 16. And let's take a look. Now again, for, for uh, brevity's sake, uh, I want to pick it up kind of in the middle here. What had happened here, we're going to start with verse 25, but just prior to that, Paul, the Romans did not like what Paul and Silas were saying. They didn't like it at all. And they turned them over to the magistrates, and they were beaten with rods severely, and then turned over to the custody of the Philippian jailer, and they were put in the stocks. So here they are beaten, bruised, in probably a lot of pain, and now they're in the stocks. That's comfortable, right? That's comforting. And um, in verse 25, here they are beaten and in the stocks. In verse 25 it says, But at midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Did you pick up their flag? They just didn't sit there and say, woe is me, I'm hurting, I've been beaten, I'm in these stocks, it's uncomfortable, woe is me, and, and, and just moan and groan. They prayed and they sang hymns to God and the prisoners heard, they didn't whisper it, right? They did it so that everybody heard and all the prisoners heard. They were listening to them. 
Now, here's where the, I said there, is a, there are miracles involved in this still today. We talked about the Lord's miracles as his flag. And there are miracles involved in this today. And I want you to see this here in this account of Paul and Silas. They're singing. They prayed and they're singing hymns. The prisoners were listening, listening to them. Verse 26, here comes the miracle. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison door open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. That would have been a merciful thing for him to do under the situation because in Rome, whoever was in charge of the prison, if anyone escaped, it was on them. And he did not want to suffer the death that they would give him. So he was ready to, to uh, kill himself uh, with his own sword. Now, um, in verse 26, it tells us that suddenly there was an earthquake so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken. When you, present, when you identify with Christ by whatever means is appropriate, and these, these are excellent means in our economy and in our day. The, there may not be earthquakes, but God will begin to work. When God knows that you're serious about representing him to a lost and dying world, miracles will begin to happen. He'll see that you're ready, and he'll begin to use you in a mighty way, and you're going to, if you want an exciting Christian life, that's the way to get one. If, 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 if it's boredom to you every week, you go off, you, you, you get your groceries, and you drive to work, and then you come home, and, and you watch TV, and you go to bed, and you get up the next day, and you do the same old thing, and if it just becomes humdrum to you, well, you come here once on Sunday, and you get through that, and then it's back to the same old weekly stuff again. If you want an exciting Christian life, Make certain that people around you know that you represent heaven, that you represent God. And just as Jesus had no form or comeliness that we should desire him just because of his appearance, don't think that, well, I don't have to do this. I don't have to do anything like this. I don't have to do this flag stuff because I, my, they should know by my smile. Listen, I, I've got to ask you something here. How many times have you encountered someone for the first time and there was something about them and you wondered if they were Christians? You know, you know what I'm talking about. But you're not sure. Maybe it was at Wegmans back at the meat market and you needed this certain cut of meat so you got a hold of the butcher. And this, this person just seemed to be, there seemed to be something about them. And you wondered if they were Christians. You looked for something, you, you looked for something like this maybe, and you didn't see anything. Um, so you, you didn't get a clue that way. So you didn't say anything, and then you go about your business. The next week, you need another different cut of meat, and, you, and, and so you, you talk to the same butcher, and all of a sudden, his countenance is not good, is not Christian-like. Uh, he, he may have, have used some language that wasn't appropriate. And now you know. But you wondered that first time, because there, there was just something about them. See, you can't tell. We don't have any form or comeliness just by our appearance or maybe a few words that we say uh, in, in con conversing with people that are going to tip people off as to who we really are and who we really represent. Now, um, something I noticed um, Don and Brenda, this is driving me nuts. Uh, I'll tell you why. In verse 25 here, he says, But at midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Where are those hymns? What are those hymns? This is not something they made up because they're singing them together so they know them. They're both singing them together. They're lost. I'm certain they're lost. And um, if we had them, Don, we could get somebody to write an arrangement for the choir or for the worship team. <laughs> we could sing these. Um, 
You know what a, do you ever think about our heritage? What an amazing heritage we have. I mean, we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ, if you know him as Lord and Savior. We're going to spend eternity with him in glory. Not only that, we're going to be able to sit down and talk to Moses. You ever think about those things? Pastor Ken has been taking us through uh, a series in Exodus about uh, the, the incredible things that Moses was confronted with and having to serve God in the way that he did in order to free the children of Israel. We're going to be able to sit down and talk with them. We're going to be able to sit down and talk with Esther and Mordecai, Daniel and his friends, David and Solomon, uh, um, Lazarus and, and, and his sisters, Mary and Martha, and the list goes on and on. But you know what I want to do, Don and Brenda? When we get there, I want to grab a hold of Paul and Silas, and I want to organize a concert. And I want them to sing these hymns so that we can hear them for the, probably the first time. Brenda? That's true. Could have been one of those, but I'd like to find out. So. Anyway, sorry for that rabbit trail. It, it's always driven me nuts. All right, so the miracle happens, verse 26. Suddenly there's an earthquake, and the, the jailer thinks that um, they're all gone, they've all escaped, and he's about to kill himself. Verse 28, but Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Paul knew the miracle. He saw the miracle because he had no idea that those prisoners, once the other prisoners, once their chains fell off, that they wouldn't scatter, that they wouldn't flee. And he saw the miracle of God and the fact that God held them there. Verse 29, then he called the jailer, called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out saying, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I tell you, if you will identify with Christ, and you know what we do when we go from house to house tuning pianos? I mentioned the butcher at Wegmans and, and how maybe that first encounter they seemed, you know, maybe they were a Christian. Well, we get customers that we wonder about. So you know what we do? We start looking for things on the wall and, things, and a Bible laying on a table. You know, you can put your Bible out at work or if you don't work at a job, if you're, if you're a stay-at-home mom or something, and, the, and a man is coming to repair the furnace, slide your Bible out there with, you know, in a place where he's going to be walking by. Put your flag out. So we look for the flags. Don't you do that? Don't you look? Especially when you're in someone's home. You look for a Bible laying there or for something on the wall. Um, Ken and Dawn just sent a, a sign that we were able to make for them. Uh, uh, it is well with my soul uh, to her mom. And um, she's going to put it up in her house. You look for those things. And miracles will happen. When God knows you're serious and knows you're in business, that you've hung out your shingle. And as, as the Lord said, we're to be fishers of men. And that's what we're talking about. You're baiting the hook. You're going to drop it in the water. Some fish will come and sniff it and swim away. Some fish will come, they'll grab a hold and spit it out. But we're talking about the parable of the sower here, right? The seed must fall on, on, uh, on good soil, and that, that fish will come and will grab that hook and be hooked. And uh, one for Christ. Uh, and uh, that's what we're talking about here. So... Um, The Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. They were ready, right? Be ready to give an answer. The ambassador must know what to say when the people come, inquiring about their nation. Verse 32, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, the jailer washed their, their, their wounds, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Your smiling face is not enough. Paul identified with the God of heaven, with the country that he was a citizen of in that jail, and God grabbed a hold of it and used it. 
and he'll do the same with you. Uh, I speak from experience. I had a plaque, uh, a, 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 a picture that I hung on my cubicle wall at work. It was about this, this high, and it was the 2 Corinthians 5, 17 verse that we've already seen. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation with the butterfly. And that opened more doors um, over the 15 years or so that, that as a saved person at Xerox, uh, I shared the gospel with probably 300 people. Now, that's not impressive really when you divide, the 15, divide that out over the 15 years. That's not all that many. But it was a steady stream. And God used that uh, in, in a wonderful way. Uh, m most of them did not receive Christ that I knew of. Now, it's a lot of years since then, and they may have. Um, we won't know till we get to glory the ones that, that we shared the gospel with and what the, what the final outcome was. We will not know. But um, uh, when people know, even though they may never talk to you about it, once they see that, once they see your flag, they identify that with you. Now, when that happens, if you do that, if you come out for Jesus Christ, wherever you are, um, you're, you're going to have to be on guard with your testimony. And that's a good thing. Amen? That's a good thing. But when people see that and, I, and know that that's you that has put, that has put this out, um, they may never talk to you about it, but they're going to know who you are. And they're watching and they know what a Christian ought to act like. They know what a Christian ought to act like, so you have to be on your guard. When, when I finished my career with Xerox and Webster, um, a, a, such a thing happened because of that identification. Uh, another coworker was leaving the company, so they had this, this, they always have this party for them, and they had it in one of the conference rooms, and he had this movie he wanted to watch. I had no idea what it was. So they got the movie, and we all went into the conference room. They had, must have been about 40, 50 of us. They started showing this movie. And in the first few seconds of the movie, there were men throwing beer on bare-chested women. I got up and left immediately and went back to my cubicle and went back to work. My boss, who had done nothing more than see my flag, that's all she had, we, she had never opened, a discussion had never opened about the gospel with her, came and got me. I wasn't in my cubicle three minutes, and she came and got me, apologizing for the movie and telling me we have shut the movie off. As soon as you left, we shut the movie off. And then they were just going on with the food, and she was begging me to come back. That's the effect it's going to have. And that's all I did was put my flag out. So those are the kind of things that, uh, that will happen. And they're miracles. You have to see them as such. All right, let's come back to what Pastor Ken shared with us back in March in Matthew chapter 5. Turn to Matthew chapter 5 as we close. Three verses here is all we need to deal with, verses 14 through 16, and this is smack in the middle of the Beatitudes, and it's largely ignored, be, I think, overlooked in, in salvation message, soul-winning messages, because it's kind of buried in the Beatitudes, but it's very pertinent to what we're talking about. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. You got to let your light shine. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, verse 16 is key here. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In the original language, that word see means not just to observe it, but to actually see it with understanding of what it is, to know what it is. 
And how are they going to know that a good work that you've done in their midst is of God, that they would glorify him? See, if you're following one of your coworkers out to the car after work, and there may be from here to the back of the auditorium in front of you, and maybe they put their hand in their pocket and they're, they're fumbling with their money and they accidentally drop a $20 bill. You know what a lot of people would do? If they kept walking, if that person that dropped the money kept walking and so they didn't, they didn't know they dropped it, a lot of people would just wait till they disappeared and go and grab the money and stick it in their pocket. What you and I would do is we would kind of hustle up there and we would pick up the money and catch up to them and give it back to them. Listen, if they don't know who you are and who you represent, to them you're just a nice person. Don't waste your opportunities. You don't want to waste your opportunities. You want them to know the reason that you did that, so that they will glorify God. That's what this light is all about here. Again, there were, the Lord had no form or comeliness in his personal visage that we should desire him, and neither do we. You don't want those opportunities to go wasted. You want to find some way to put your flag up, whatever that is. All right. Um, persecution, as we finish up here. Some people are worried about persecution. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Yea, and all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He also told the Corinthians, though, folks, it's a, but a light affliction. We don't get persecuted in this country. Listen, if, if you want to talk about persecution, I don't recommend you do this, but I'm going to tell you, if you'd like to try it, go home and Google these two words, Christians beheaded. Google those two words. Don't do it before bedtime, you won't sleep. Do it in the morning, so you'll have the day to kind of get over the shock of it. And you'll read about Christians, Muslims, who were converted to Christ in places like Somalia um, and, and other Muslim countries. So Google Christians beheaded, and, and you start reading that. How many of you have a copy of, of the book, uh, um, Fox's Book of Martyrs, thank you. How many of you have a copy of that? How many of you have read it all? You actually read it all? You're brave. I can't get through it. I can't get through it. Um, that's the kind of effect this will have on you if you go home and Google this. In this country, there is no excuse for us to, to, to sit there and hide and not present the gospel to people. We have it easy in this country. Just wanted to give you that perspective. Let's talk about strategy. If you're really serious about this, you will develop strategies. Like I mentioned, when the furnace repair man is coming, you'll make sure that your Bible is sitting in a, in a, whether you have it open or not, that's fine, but it should look like a Bible. I know a lot of us carry these electronic devices that we have our Bibles on, and that's fine for convenience, but people won't know that that's a Bible. So you gotta have a printed Bible. If you don't own one, I would hustle out and get one. And um, uh, you, you wanna make certain that, that uh, uh, you have something like this. You know, you could have a variety of things. One of the things we also have is a list of outgoing phone messages that, that are, are very short, but very pertinent in sharing the gospel out there. You would wanna take a look at those. What an awesome thing it would be if every member of this church had an outgoing phone message that was a ch gospel challenge. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, I've never done this, and now all these people that call, all of a sudden, they're gonna hear this, and some of these people I probably should have shared with a long time ago, but I didn't, haven't done it. You're gonna to have to bite the bullet. We've, we're all there, I've been there. You're gonna to have to bite the bullet and just do it. Please just do it. And um, now your strategy there is, you don't run to the phone and pick it up on the first ring every time, because guess what? Nobody's gonna hear the message. Now if it's somebody that comes up on your contact list and you know them and they know you and they know what you stand for, you know, fine, you, you, obviously you answer that. But if it's, if, if it's a call that you don't, a number you don't recognize, let it go to voicemail, listen. They'll leave a voicemail if it's important. You're not gonna miss anything. 
and let them hear that outgoing message. You know what else is nice about that? They're not intimidated as much because it's a recording. It's not you telling them. It's, and, and it's very effective. And um, I could tell you, uh, we've, we've had one for 30 years and always on our phone, and I could tell you endless uh, accounts of, of, of the, uh, the blessings that that's been uh, for us. Um, now, about now, let me tell you this, about now, there's a little guy in a red suit with a pitchfork that's climbed up on your shoulder, and he's whispering in your ear, and he's saying, ah, come on, you don't want to get all religious, do you? Just come, come to church on Sunday, sit in these four walls, that's fine, and fellowship with people and listen to a message, and then go back to your life and blend in and hide, and you know, you don't want to be silly. That guy's there whispering to you. Does it to me all the time. And uh, you just have to shoo him, you know, flick him off, shoo him away. Um, remember Peter, got to think about Peter. He denied the Lord three times when asked about his identification with Jesus Christ. Took him right out of the game at that point in time when he did that. Took him right out of the game because he wouldn't do it. Praise God, he made a lot up for that. Made up an awful lot for that, starting at Pentecost and beyond. Tremendous witness for Christ. One other thing I'd like to say to you as we close. Um, if you stumble over the idea of identifying with Christ in this simple way, chances are you will never witness to anyone even if God, you encounter them on the street and God opens a barn door, you know, huge barn door, chances are you won't even walk through it. I hope I'm wrong, but that's just the way it goes. If you're hiding, you're hiding. That's just the way it is. But if you fly your flag, God will open up opportunities and what a blessing you're going to have. A couple weeks ago, two, two ladies came to our door, front door, knocked on the door, rang the doorbell. Two Jehovah's Witness ladies. Uh, I was on my way out, coming down the hall, and Patty beat me to it. She got to the door, so I just stopped, and I stood in the hall, and I listened. She, she got a complete gospel witness out to these two ladies. Listen, don't get defensive with Jehovah's Witnesses. They're just lost people that need to know the Lord. She got out a complete gospel witness with them. And what we were thrilled, we talked about that for about the next two hours. How thrilling that was to have that opportunity. Isn't this all very simple? Hang out your flag and then be ready to represent your country. Be ready to give an answer. That's all there is to it. God will bring them to you. Now, if you're bold and you're, you're able to walk up to people and start a conversation and turn it into the gospel, you're able to, to do that. A lot of people have a temperament that allows them to do that. Praise God, do it. You know, that's your flag. That'll work. But a lot of us are not skilled at that. But God will bring them to you. He knows our capabilities. Pastor Ken, I'll turn it over to you.